Good evening, everyone. I'm Pastor Joel Jones, and we are back again uh, with another segment of our Walk Through the Bible, our Walking Through the Bible series. I don't know if you all can see me on Zoom. I don't see myself. Okay. Well, praise God. Better be heard than not seen, I guess, in some cases. But praise God. I thank you all for joining us tonight. There we go. As always, we are um, I can do this if you working with uh, a few hands. Many hands make light work, and I thank God for, for the hands we do have. So, so I thank you all for joining us tonight. <clears throat> and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your mercy, your grace, your favor, Lord. We, we ask you to be with us tonight as we... Uh, uh, study your word. Teach us what we need, Lord, as a church and as individuals to be all that you've called us to be. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> again, I thank you all. And we are here to uh, continue in our Walking Through the Bible series. And you know, what we do here is uh, we're studying the word, going through the Bible as dictated by the Lord. And we're trying to uh, just discern the things that the Lord has for us in the Bible, the, the, the things that, that uh, as led by the Holy Spirit of God. So we thank all of you for coming and joining us. This is where we come to, to not only uh, study the Word at home, but we want to study um, as guided by the Lord in, uh, in our churches and uh, believing that God has a concerted um, divine plan for the body of Christ. Each one of us being in our churches, then God has a plan for you according to the group that he's put you with. And how can we know, how can we have a, a team effort if we're not on the same page, running the same plays uh, for the coach? Amen. So that's a, that's a good way to put it. And uh, I use the team analogy a lot because that's what we are as the body of Christ. I would look at the right ones. We're a team. So uh, I thank you all for being a part of the team. And we help each other. So the Lord is, God is good. Amen. Amen. So um, <clears throat> again, those of you who are on uh, um, Facebook Live and uh, what else? YouTube, we thank you all for joining in. And uh, Pray that we can all learn together and, uh, from this study. Now, uh, so last week we ended Hosea, and I asked you all to read ahead, to read into the book of Joel. I like the, I like the sound of that book for some reason, but I, I, I thank you all for, <laughs> uh, for reading ahead, and we're, we're just going to go into parts of it and see. It's actually a pretty short uh, book. Hmm. But uh, that's, that, that's good, it, but we're going to go through it and, and see what the Lord has for us now. Uh, um, I trust that you all have so, sort of become familiar uh, with some of it, and I know we've probably all read it, those of you who are in Christ, but uh, sometimes we, we pick up little bits and pieces, so we'll just uh, work our way through it. But just a little background about the prophet Joel. Uh, he was a prophet whose ministry... Um, was about from 835 to 796 BC. That was about the time that he was uh, doing his ministry. Now, the the audience of Joel's um, prophesying was who? Who was his audience? Who was the target of his uh, preaching? Right off the top of your head, anybody know? Okay, well, it was the southern kingdom of Judah, right? Uh, Unlike Hosea, who was talking to the people of uh, Ephraim, Israel, now uh, uh, Joel was sent to the people of, uh, uh, of Judah. And it's believed, it's believed that Joel lived in Jerusalem, but not much is known about him, okay? So, uh, but we do know that he's considered uh, uh, one of the minor prophets 
and you have the major prophets and the minor prophets. The Bible, the Bible doesn't say that, but we know that they sort of categorize the books of the Bible, the major prophets being the ones with more information, uh, such as Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and different people. And the, mi the minor prophets, they say, was because the information put out was a minor amount. So it's a way of categorizing uh, the prophets in the Bible. But we can learn much from the ministry about the uh, desperate state of the people uh, of God during this period. As always, there's always something more we can learn in the Bible. Joel's message, what kind of message did Joel put out? Anybody know? It was a message, what, uh, Sister, Sister Jeanette, you have to unmute. I see your hand up. Repentance. Repentance, amen. Anybody else? Judgment, repentance, amen. Um, and yet with that, there was what? God was saying yes. Uh, Joel was saying yes. Uh, he talked about the judgment and we'll see that. And we know about repentance. But what else did God do? What else does God do? What have we found God to be doing when he says yes? You got a spanking coming. But what else does he do? Sister Liz, you're muted, I think. I saw your mouth moving. Oh, okay. I thought she was answering. Are we frozen? Are they frozen? I think so. But that means I'm frozen? Okay. Well, but you still on okay. Facebook. You All still right. That's Facebook, okay. That's so fine. Not a problem. So, so what we know about, about Joel and... Um, what we know about his message, okay, now she's moving. His message was one of judgment and, uh, as Sister Jeanette was saying, repenting. But then along that line, we always see God as being merciful and forgiving, right? He gives you a chance to do the right thing. Amen? And uh, as we work through these machines, we've got... Uh, we're on Zoom and somehow it's uh, frozen, but we'll continue they on. They can always jump on Facebook. Those of you who are who are seeing, and uh, if you hear me say that or repeat, that's because I want to give deference to everyone and try to keep us on the same page. So bear with us as we go along. But as I was saying, God is merciful and He's forgiving, and. Uh, while God is merciful and will forgive, it's important for people to know that God's forgiveness comes about when people do what? When they turn, turn from sin. Isn't that right? That's one of the mainstays of God's will for us. As related to 2 Chronicles 7.14 where he says, If my people who are called by my name will just humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. That's a uh, verse that we all know and uh, most of us know. And it's a, it's a good one to tuck, a, tuck away into your belt because God always is looking for hearts that are turned to him. So he will forgive. So the people of Judah had come under judgment by God. That's what we, that's what Joel uh, the prophet was putting across. And um, we'll see as we go along how that works out in, in uh, the lives of the people in Judah. And uh, the messages that God gave Joel very clearly and very consistently during his time of prophesying. So um, let me get to that part that I'm looking for right now as uh, Pastor Amisa works with the uh, with the social media here. So <clears throat> so we're probably going to stay around the first uh, the first uh, chapter tonight in, in Joel, and we'll just look at it as a, a break-in period. 
I was going to ask, who wants to tell us uh, why Judah was coming under judgment? I'm sure you all know, but why God had to bring them under judgment? Well, there were a few reasons, right? And I'll just go ahead and answer these myself. Judah had become prosperous, okay? They had some stuff. Judah had gotten to the point where they were uh, comfortable. Let's put it like that, okay? They had become comfortable. They had become complacent. They had turned to idolatry. They had turned to other sinful types of behaviors. Basically, they had come to take God for granted. And I don't know about you, but I don't know many fathers that want to be taken for granted. A father wants a family to love him and to respect him and to uh, be thankful that he is their father. And the Lord is no different. I always say he's the, the father of all time. Okay? So if you have children that are disrespectful and you give them everything that they need and they become spoiled and I'm that on mute. Who, I'm, I'm on mute just a minute please okay I'll no, get I'll I'm get on, to that I'm on mute on the uh, zoom but that's okay I'm sure you all can still hear me on uh, Facebook live and also on YouTube so I'll just continue on we're working around three different or four, three different machines right now so bear with us but yes um, the people of Judah had become complacent. They had become complacent. If y'all can hear me, give me a thumbs up. They had become complacent and uh, they had become prosperous. And so in so doing, they turned to idolatry and, and different things like that. Okay. They, uh, so, so we will, uh, we'll be looking into those things uh, that basically they had taken God for granted. Okay. I don't think they can hear me. Pastor, you're muted. Okay, I'm still muted. She's working on that, you guys. Am I still muted? Do you see a line in the mute? I can't tell from here. You're good. Okay, thank you. All right. Praise God. We're all on one page again. Is that right? Okay. All on one page. All the social medias... Now we are social for real, okay? YouTube, Facebook Live, and Zoom. Uh, Pastor Ann Lisa's got such a busy job. She's Praise a little, God. she's a little servant of the Lord. I, I just need you all to let me know, uh, Pastor, God. when that line goes across. I can't that. see it, dear. Okay. But praise God. Somebody'll let you know. But anyway, so uh, if you guys didn't hear, I was just saying that there were some things that were going on. In, um, in, uh, 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 in the book of Joel, and I was going to ask, but we were muted. I was asking. So the people of, of Judah had come under judgment. Sister Jeanette had mentioned that. They had come under, uh, 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 the message was a message of repentance. God was going to judge them, and he talks about that. And I was, I was going to ask you all, who wants to tell us why they were coming under judgment? Those of you on Zoom, you might want to why do you think the people of Judah were that that uh, uh, Joel had to bring this message of judgment? Anybody want to touch that one? Because oh. of their sinfulness. Sinful ways. That's right. They they have become sinful. There's a few reasons. Even if we break that down further, what were some of the ways that that you know that they have become sin, uh, uh, prone to sin? They had um, forsaken God and chosen the gods of the, uh, the of the people that uh, God had ran out of the uh, mm -hmm. out of the land and told them not to follow their ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they had followed the ways of the gods of the other people and relied on those gods. Instead mm -hmm. of God Himself, they basically had rejected God as their God. Amen. That's a good one, Minister Dora. She said that they had uh, started patterning patterning themselves around the people around them. 
the pagan people of the land, they had started adopting their ways. That's one thing that they were doing. And uh, they were having a good time doing it. You see what I mean? Uh, the, the scriptures tell us that they had become prosperous. That's a good word. That's a word I want you all to remember. They had become prosperous, complacent, okay? And they had saw something good on the other side. You know the old saying that said the grass is not always greener on the other side. And sometimes you get to following other people and you pick up their bad habits and you turn from what you were taught. And that's basically what they did. So they, as, as Liz, Sister Liz said, they started this sinful behavior and it grew. Okay. And basically they wound up taking God for granted by turning away from him. Okay. And, and that's not good. And, and that word prosperous, it, 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 we can use that in today's times. Prosperous as in prosperity. Amen. And that's what they did. Now, uh, we just finished the book of Hosea where he warned people of this same rebellious behavior, didn't he? He was warning people of the same thing. If we go down the line, we see that this continues to surface. But what's the difference? What's the difference here? Uh, uh, the, Hosea was talking to the people of, of northern Israel, or the northern kingdom. And like I said, um, Joel was talking to who? The other side, right? Southern kingdom, right? So they should know better. And like a, the Lord makes references to these things. Joel was speaking to the southern, southern kingdom of Judah. So we see that sin is what? What, what is it about sin? It's contagious. It's contagious. It's pervasive. Go ahead, Brother Terry. Your hand is up. Yeah, when I was reading this here in, in verse five, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it was it was speaking to those that had addictions and and and, and going that way where it talked about awake you drunkards and the weeping and wail mm -hmm. and the drinkers of wine, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and we still have that thing going on today. We pray for my son every day with his addictions and drugs and alcohol. Yes, yes. When we become of a pervasive nature and we start taking on uh, uh, the different tones of people and, and the people in the land and we pattern ourselves after the world, we get into all kinds of trouble. And that's what we're seeing right here. This, this is a lesson. So, so with regard to Judah, we can conclude from the Bible that our lifestyles of uh, prosperity and being complacent, their apathy and, uh, and uh, the things that they adopted in idolatry would inevitably, inevitably bring about God's judgment on them, God's wrath. And you have some uh, com comments here. You have Lizette mm -hmm. said a message of warning, mm -hmm. uh, judgment, and repentance. That Wanda said disobedience and rebellion. That's right. Disobedience, rebellion, uh, judgment, repentance. Both uh, Sister Lizette and Wanda are saying that, and that's true. And, and we need to see that in today's times, right? We see it in our society, right? When we turn to false solutions, when we turn to false hope, when we turn to false leaders, following the ways of man instead of the ways of God, we get into trouble, don't we? Mm -hmm. God's rules go out the window. We start enacting our own laws, our own uh, ideas of how to solve things. And what about the church? Let me ask you this. Should the church know better from this or no? What do you think? Okay, of course we should. But do we? Do we? That's the question. Tell me, what are a few ways that we can tell that the church has become influenced by the world? I'm going to put that question now. You ought to take your time. But what do you think are some of the ways that we can tell right away that the church has been influenced by the world? We said that uh, uh, Judah was influenced by the pagan countries. So, Brother Dave, I saw your hand up. Then I say, Karen's. You all tell yeah. us. Go ahead. When you, when you see church becoming a show rather than preaching the word uh, and preaching the truth of the word, they're not soft soaping the word that, that they are, are to be preaching. It's, it's, 
They're talking about, you know, you know they got the one where it says, you live your best life now. Oh, that's a good those, kind of, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. You all hear that? They said that when the world, when you see the church uh, uh, adopting things like live your best life now and, and different things like that. And what was the first one you said, Dave? That they, that, that ch show, church is more of a show. It becomes a show. Church. Okay. All right. Sister Karen, it was your hand up. And then Sister Liz. No? Can't hear you, Karen. You got to un unmute. Okay. Okay. Let me went on. Somehow somebody put me on. I was off. Okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes they act like movie stars, you know. Oh. Prosperity, please. Amen. You got them. Amen. And they have it's more like an entertainment. Okay. Like they do entertainment, you know. Okay. I mean, anybody yeah. welcome, you know. Not And they act like, and the music. It's mm -hmm. almost like the word. Amen. That's what Dave was talking about. Sister Liz and then Sister Jeanette. You know, I was pretty much going to say the same thing. When, okay. when the music, when the uh, even the singers, they're using their gifts that, that the Lord has given them to entertain versus to minister. Okay. Sister Jeanette. You're muted. I was going to say the same, but then they preach out the word. They're not preaching the truth. Ah, amen. And also, and also, instead of giving glory to God, they call people that come to see them their fans. So they still has a, have a little of the world in them where they think they're, you know, like uh, they think they have fans and my fans. You even mm -hmm. hear them say my fans. Mm -hmm. All of those things we're seeing that are not genuine. Well, not walking the talk. Preach a word, but then act opposite of the word. Amen. Amen. Not being doers of the word, but just hearers only. Say one thing and doing another. We we see a lot of that, and uh, we've seen it during this COVID nineteen. It's been a it's been a revealer of sorts. I I, I believe. In fact, I'm sure of that that the Lord is revealing things because He reveals sin. He exposes it, and by emulating. Prosperity. That's another thing. And have you seen that we want to rub shoulders with the with with celebrities? And we want to get close to the world as if we can get some of that, you know, and we can we can be like the world. I think that's a big problem that we're seeing. I've seen pastors. I've seen pastors change their doctrine while allowing celebrities with money to speak on platforms and different things like that. Have you all seen that? I, we've seen it, okay? We've seen it. Uh, that 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 one with uh, uh, the guy that dresses like a woman when he came on the platform and laid hands on, on the pastor, that's a big one, you all. That's a big one because uh, we say God is not mocked. And when you do something and you're making a living by uh, going against God's word, you got to do what you got to do. OK. And uh, but when it comes to the word of God, God doesn't say if you dress like a woman, uh, uh, I'll bless you if you feed the hungry. He doesn't say that. He said man shall not wear a woman's attire and vice versa in Deuteronomy 22, 5. So regardless of what we think we're doing, God doesn't uh, go against his word, especially when it's when his word says to be holy as I am holy. So if you do that on your own, okay, but we as the church do not condone it. And when we start condoning it, we're giving something for something. It's called compromising. That's a sign of the compromising church. So when we see things like that happening or um, the same guy giving the pastor a million dollar offering and then laying hands on him, here's a man that lives against the word of God, but because of money, he can get to where he wants to be and everybody will worship him instead of worshiping God. I'm not saying that's what happened, but that's what we see a history of in the Bible. People getting what they want to get and living in their own comfortable nature, but not wanting to adhere to God. Mm -hmm. And we have to be careful about that church. We really do. Uh, we, we saw that a while back with the guy that was making all these tennis shoes and calling them Jeezy and Jesus and Yeezy and 
uh, whatever else was coming out, cheesy. All these things were coming out and people were flocking to the church as long as this person flocked to the church. But you notice you haven't heard much of that lately, have you? Why? If people were turned to Christ, where are they now? If we're going to follow God, you know, you follow God in the good times and you follow him in the bad times. Knowing that he's going to bring you through the bad times. But when we follow people, we get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And when we follow, and that's what, we're, that's what we saw in Judah. That's what we saw in Israel. Uh, they were getting something and they were, they were uh, uh, happy and prosperous. And they turned away from God. We need to learn about those things because we see it going on right now in the church. Uh, when it comes to money and prosperity and celebrity status and patterning ourselves uh, after the world. Why? Why? When it says that uh, in the Bible that we are actually, we will judge angels. That's what it says in, in uh, first, uh, first Corinthians. 6-2, do you not know that we will judge the world? So why would we want to be like the world? You see what I mean? God has a plan for his people. We're not saying that to brag about it. That's what the word says. So why would we try to be like the world? When, he, when Jesus said we are to be, he left us in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. Amen. So these are things that we see right here. Okay. Um, when we, the people of Israel and the people of Judah, in this case, in the book of Joel, uh, that uh, it says that God is not mocked. Well, right. So um, they had defiled their hands. They had defiled their hands. They had defiled their ways following the the uh, uh, the auspices or the practices of the world, and we see people doing that now. They're practicing, they're doing what the world does. And if we as a church start doing it and we allow people on, the, on God's platform to, as Dave said, put on a show, a performance, it's, it's an attempt to mock God. And it says that God is not mocked, but we have to see the devil stirring the pot. But the, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. But the people of God have to know. We're, we're supposed to know these things because we have a relationship with the Lord. Go ahead, Pastor. Yeah, and as a as a worship leader, thinking worshiping, singing with your mouth, your lips, but his, but but your heart being far from God. Amen. Doing it for the glory of man again instead of the glory of God. Well, like the word says, having a form of godliness, mm -hmm. but denying the power thereof. Right. In Second uh, Timothy three five, and all and all and also uh, uh, the the word tells us that we. In uh, Matthew 15, 8, that these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they worship me, speaking as doctrines, the commandments of men. When we start doing what men want us to do, and we come back and say, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, you bless me with all this. And God says, I never knew you. That, that's not what I wanted. That's what you wanted. That's what you got. Guess what? It wasn't even for me. It was from the counterfeiter. It was from Satan who blessed you with that money. Oh, yeah. You may have fed some hungry children. You may have clothed the homeless, and that's good. All things work together for good. I can turn that to good, but you, my friend, have done the wrong thing. You went against my word. Your sacrifice is not as good as your obedience should have been. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's what we have to know. Go ahead, Brother Dave. The pastor uh, and also was sitting there talking about the uh, worship leaders. If you look at some churches, the songs that they're singing barely mention God or Jesus or anything like that. It's like you just assume that they're, that's who they're talking to. Yes. But you can also, in, in a lot of cases, assume that they're talking about their boyfriend or girlfriend. You know, I mean, it's 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 so you know crossing over to try to make more money on the song. You know, but it's, that's not worshiping God. No, it, it's a compromise. It's a compromise. You know, the Lord gave us a, a gift a long time ago of writing music. And um, when we went into the studios uh, and the Lord gave us uh, certain songs to write, uh, you know 
it just came out. There's no way we could write after knowing the Lord and produce songs without giving him glory. We wanted people to know who we were singing about, what we're talking about, because there are a lot of ways we can coin a phrase and make it seem like we're talking about God and we'll be talking about somewhere, someone else. If you take five people in, in the congregation and, and I come up there and say, oh, he, he, you know, I love him, I just love him, and he's my everything. And each person listening might be thinking about somebody else, their father, their cousin, that old boyfriend. We don't know who is your everything. And we can't afford to slight God, not in these times when we know there is an enemy. When you know the enemy is out there, you make sure that every shot you pull off goes and hits the target. We don't want to just fire blindly. We want to make sure that every round that goes hits the target. And we want them to know that we're talking about Jesus. That Now, I, I can't say for other churches. I really can't say. But people of God, we have to be exact in what we do. We have to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God. Go ahead, uh, Pastor. You know, uh, when, when Pastor and I came out of the world, the Lord was preparing us for what was in the world. He took us out of the world. We're, 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 um, we're of the world, but we're not in the world. But once we started recording... I believe me when I tell you that there were uh, the the per the people were saying okay now when you sing when you sing these songs they they were actually saying this is how we, you need to dress and it was in a seductive way because it wasn't about pleasing God or saving souls it was about drawing people it was about uh, when you're singing the songs. It was about, it's, you're talking about getting a big record deal from a secular recording record company. So record companies don't care about saving souls. It's all about making money. So right then and there, if I didn't have the Lord, if we didn't have the Lord, they were, they were put, getting me ready to be a secular song, a, a, a gospel song, singer, but, but uh, having the mind of the world and being like the world. So it's so you we have to be very very careful because when they start that money start coming in that's what the record company is interested in they're interested in making money not yeah. saving souls and, and and I can I can add to that because I was with her of course that's why the Lord brought us in together if she was by herself with with the vocal gift that He's given her um, she could she could be singing anywhere if that's what if that was a plan to do. But because we're with the Lord, the Lord showed us and he brought us in together. That's another thing about us both being pastors. This is God's plan, it's not ours. Because they sent us somewhere and right now, uh, if, it was, if it was, if we had followed the advice of this certain person, I won't mention any name because he's still out there and he's still around, but with Sony and BMI, the contract would have just certainly would have come around if that's what we wanted. But that wasn't God's plan. And when we went there to record, he said, well, this is, you know, you need to dress like this. And you need to, you know, you need to show this and you need to show that. And this type of thing. And, you know, and, and he was serious. Now, this was a so-called Christian, you all. And that's what he's telling us. So you know that wasn't going to work. And you know it wasn't the Lord, because the Lord had yeah. had me get rid of all my hoochie clothes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, we had, got, we had gotten rid of, you know. I that, had to throw them out. That may not have, give them away, throw them away. That, that may have worked a few years prior to coming to the Lord. Maybe back in 90 or 80, in the 80s and 90s, when we were doing uh, 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 Prince's music and all that kind of stuff. But once we came to the Lord, the wardrobe changed. Everything changed. The wardrobe changed. Changed. The everything changed, and that's any, what I'm saying. Any distractions. Any no distractions. distractions, and it wasn't about being on a stage or a platform. And I'm so glad that that God is who He is, but but I but but I shake my head because as people we don't seem to get it, and we keep having to repeat the process, and. 
and 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 it seems like as soon as the devil rubs uh, uh, waves that carrot in front of our noses like little rabbits, we just we just go go to that thing, you know, and we want what the world has. We shouldn't want what the world what the world amen, has. Amen. And and I see that in Judah, and I see how the people we're so easily led the wrong way. And I'm seeing it in the church. You know, we we as God's people, we know better. And the devil knows we know better, but he knows what to put in front of us. And that's how he uses people. Mm -hmm. It says God is not mocked, but the devil will use you to try to mock God. And that's why we have to stay focused on this. And that's what was going on when Joel went to Judah and with his messages. And it's no different now. God judged Judah. And he's going to judge his church. He's going to judge the people in the church. And so, Judah, Judah had to know that, and just like we have to know, that God is the one that's in control. Amen. It's going to be God's will. So no matter uh, all the gifts that God has given you, we always thought it was a gift for our, our will. We do what we want to do with the gifts that we had. But we quickly found out that even with the gifts that the Lord give you, you're going to use them the way he wants you to use them, not the way you want to use them if you are sold out for Jesus. Amen. So let's do this. Let's go over some of chapter one. And uh, Pastor, you feel like reading? Mm -hmm. Can you read from verse one to verse 10 for us? Okay. We don't need to cover okay. the whole thing, but somewhere around there. Okay. Until the Lord says stop. Okay, just a minute. Okay, so um, I'm going to read from from verse chapter uh, one, the mm -hmm. book of Joel, or some people will say Joel. Okay, the word of the Lord that came to Joel or Joel, the son of Pethuel. Pethuel, hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days? or even in the days of your fathers, tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another, uh, and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste, he has laid waste my vine, and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. His branches. Its are, branches. Hmm? Its, its branches. Oh, is it it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Its branches are made white. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth. I don't know what I'm reading down here, and I can just pick it up here. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Uh, lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth. For the husband of her youth, the grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The prince mourn. The priest. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. The priest mourn who ministers to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Amen. Pastor. That's good enough. I appreciate that. Uh, so, some things here. We gather from this that the prophet Joel is talking about destruction. We see that, right? That's what he's talking about in here. But what's the source of the destruction that he mentions? That If anyone saw that. What is the source of that destruction? Brother the, Terry? The locust. The locust. The locust, right? He mentions the locust. Now, this is a question that I want to ask. Do we know if Joel is speaking of an actual swarm or plague of locusts? 
or uh, coming upon the land, or does he mention the locusts as a symbol of invading force or military coming upon his people? Which one do you think? I, I think this part of it, where they were speaking up here, because uh, the priests mourn it because there's no more grapes for them to give a drink offering. Mm -hmm. The field is wasted. You think he's... You think that's not figurative, that's uh, literal right there. Anybody else? The sister I think Jeanette? It's both figurative and literal. Figurative yeah. and literal. Okay. I think so, yeah. Which part which part is figurative? Well we'd have to go over it again, huh? Yeah, yeah. I get I get what you're saying though. Anybody else? Sister Jeanette, your hand was up. No? I it's real. Mm -hmm. The look is real, and then destroying them to show that they needed to repent. And because even the animals was um, crying mm -hmm. out because they were starving, mm -hmm. and uh, I was to show them that I think it was to show them that they about their sins and they needed to repent. But the side called the fast and whatever, but mm -hmm. it's real. Okay, <laughs> think it's Just real. Who is that talking? That was me. Oh, Mr. Dora. Okay, go ahead. And then it's, Sister Audrey. But it's also a, a foretelling of a future event that's going to happen. Um, when we got to verse 6, we were talking about uh, a nation. Mm -hmm. A nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. Sister Audrey? Yeah, I was thinking it was real also because um, of what Moses said that when he told them they would become an astonishment in the Proverbs back in uh, Deuteronomy 28, 38 to 42, and that the Lord would send locusts, you know, as a punishment to mm -hmm. um, get repentance to the people. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else have anything to add to that? Um, <clears throat> certainly. Certainly, uh, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. I know there were locusts, and I know the Lord sent locusts. I believe that part, but I tend to think that part of it is figurative and part is literal, That um, because of uh, part about the teeth of the lion and different things, the fangs. Uh, but I know that he sends locusts on the land, and he's doing the same thing today, right? Mm -hmm. He's sending locusts and bats. He's sending some stuff, you all. He's... There was a swarm going around about a year ago all through, uh, I forget if it was East Africa or somewhere, and they were tearing, the people were dying. You know, those locusts come like a cloud. And the Bible speaks of that. So we know that uh, it's real, but also he'll send a swarm of soldiers to, to get his people in line too. And I think that's the part that Sister Liz was talking about. From what I've read, uh, uh, and this is what scholars think, they... They say they really don't know to what extent they believe it's both. They, they believe it's both. We know it's one way or the other. We know that the locusts came, and of course, all that's been documented in, if you, as you go through the Bible. But, the, the, uh, but either way, what I'm trying to see is that it signifies destruction, doesn't it? That's the bottom line. He's showing destruction and he's saying, he's teaching that there will be destruction if we don't get right. Mm -hmm. Right? We can agree on that, right? We know that point. The point is this. The people's hearts, as well as their senses, had been dulled so that they were almost oblivious to sin. And when you become oblivious to sin, where you're just going to do what you want to do, the Lord sends something to pull to get you right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Whether it's locusts or whether it's a plague or whether it's a, a hard times, he'll snatch that job out from under your feet. He will take you and you'll be fat and happy one minute and the next minute you find yourself you don't have a dime in your pocket and you'll be wondering how you make it. You may even lose things. And this is what uh, 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 what we see. And this is this is what he was saying in his word, if you read. He said, all like Brother Terry was talking about verse 5. He says, awake you drunkards and weep. In other words, you've been drunk, now you're about to cry, okay? 
the party is over. That's what yeah. he's saying. He's, yeah, it's like someone that has been going through life just, you know, thinking they're receiving all these blessings and all of a sudden it's like it's gone. the Holy Spirit leave and they're dry. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I, I don't feel I don't feel God. I don't I don't I don't see him. I don't feel him anymore. I don't if I when I read his word, I don't even know I I want to I want to get I want to be hungry for him again. Amen. So that's what I I feel that this is happening to to, to here spiritually mm -hmm. physically and spiritually that th we can feel like this mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. physical bodies mm -hmm. do you know what, 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 what are we in agreement that this what, the people of uh, uh judah had been so taken by sin that it was almost they didn't even recognize themselves as sinning anymore uh that's what was going on. Now, this is the question I want to ask. Can, can somebody describe to us how that works in the lives of Christians today or the current posture of churches? How are we so oblivious to sin that we really, it doesn't even affect us anymore? Can somebody come up with some ways or anybody want to, want to look at that? Anything the Lord has given you off the top of your head? How are we as a church can say we're in Christ, but by the same token, we show ourselves to be sinning just like the world and not even think anything of it. Go ahead, Sister Karen, your hand is up. Unmute yourself. Other way, other ways they do it, it because it's so slowly. And you know, and now, you know, the Bible said don't look at people. You know, and you seeing people sleeping all down. With each other. Well, okay. And, you know, and That's one way. You can be caught in the different things. Okay. I have a comment here, too. Mm -hmm. Elwanda is on, on, Hold uh, on, you all. One on Facebook. And she, oh, for me? Yeah, no, her. Go ahead. No. Is this for me you're saying? No, go ahead and say it. Sorry. Oh, Elwanda is saying on Facebook, uh, it had become a practice habit, which is dangerous. Okay. So you can practice something so, so much that you don't feel. Elwanda said they practice it, and it, you practice something so much that you don't feel it. Anybody else? Uh, Brother Terry and then Dave. Yeah, the Bible says that uh, if you know to do good and do not do it, it's a sin. So if you see something wrong happening and you just turn your back on it and act like it's just going to go away because you went away, uh, that's a sin. Amen. And, and, and to constantly, people, people will do that. They will watch something happen. Uh, like we've seen with that big guy that pushed the, the, the Chinese lady to the ground and, and the people, they literally closed the door on her. Yeah. Know? That was a sin. They might not have saw it as a sin, mm -hmm. but, but it was. Amen. You're right. Brother Dave? It's, it's also uh, like the church accepting um, homosexuality and, and saying, you, you sure come in and stay, stay, you don't have to change. You know, and uh, you, you're accepted in, the, in this church as you are. Yeah, you can be on the board. You can be in leadership and, and all these other things. When that is strictly forbidden by, by God's tenets. And so we, you know, it's, it's when church sways over to society and tries to coddle society That's without awesome. taking and dealing with standing for the truth of God instead of, you know, when, when they know that they need to be. Amen. Amen. Pastor, go ahead. You have something? Yeah, I just want to add that um, if, if one grieves the Holy Spirit to a point and they continue in sin and doing what they want to do in the flesh and, and not practicing and disciplining their bodies to, to be obedient to a holy God, then one could grieve the Holy Spirit to a point that they won't even feel that what they're doing is wrong anymore. They feel I can't feel it, so I'm, it must be I must be doing the right thing. You know, I, drinking, adultery, fornicating. They don't feel because they grieved the Holy Spirit when they received the Holy Spirit. They did not uh, practice. They didn't discipline. They didn't that that new creation. You have to do something. You just can't not do anything and continue in your sin. And once a person, once a people do that, then they feel that it's okay. You know, they don't, they stop believing what the Bible say and just start interpreting it that way by saying, God is love and you can't judge me. Mm. And also uh, being desensitized to the word of God. Uh, we individually,
individually should be studying the Word of God. We should be in the Word of God every day. I've read the Word of God and been so convicted, you know, just me and the Bible, uh, and that has changed me. And if people don't read the Word of God, they won't know if they're hearing the truth or not. And if you sit up under someone who's not speaking the truth of God, who's compromising and telling you something, and you believe that person because you don't know what what the, what they're saying is true or not, and you just sit there under mm-hmm. that false teaching or incorrect teaching, and you become molded and transfer uh, and transformed to live by what that person is saying instead of what the Word of God is saying. Amen. And that's why you have to go back to the basics of Christ of the Word of God, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? And Philippians that we've been talking about, 2.12. And then also uh, um, um, 2 Timothy uh, 2.15 that tells us to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Because in the end, it's you that has to go before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be responsible for what we know, right? Go ahead, Sister Karen. I see your hand. Leaders don't know how to discipline the congregation. To you know, the Bible have laws that if you see somebody sinning, you're supposed to come to them first. Mm-hmm. And then if they don't listen to you, then you take two of them and do it again. That, that's what the word said. So mm-hmm. there's no discipline in the church. Mm-hmm. And see, the pastors are accountable, mm-hmm. the leaders, how mm-hmm. they uh, do their shepherd. Because, you know, you don't want anyone to perish. Exactly. So, you know. Exactly. Um, it comes from the top down. And uh, God knows what we're responsible for. He knows what you're supposed to know. He knows... Um, you're going to be held responsible for what you know. Mm -hmm. God knows the heart of people. Let me just read something to you in in Romans. You all know this probably. Let's go to Romans 1. And uh and we're going to go to verse 22. And it says, uh, no, let's go to 21. It says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Then it says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Now this is part in 26. Said, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now this is this part right here says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting. And I think that's where we started. Somebody said that. That he turns you over to certain things because we practice it so much. Whether it's uh, sexual immorality, because right here, it goes on. Verse 29 said, being filled with all, not just talking about sexual immorality, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and evil-mindedness. It says all those things right there. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning. They can't even tell. They don't have no, you lose your discernment. Undiscerning, untrustworthy. You can't trust you because you backstab somebody. Untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful, full of hard-heartedness. And then it says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but they approve of those who practice them. So we're talking about 
people that have been sinning and make, somebody said it, I think it was Sister Karen said, making a practice of sin. And when we start practicing that thing, we get desensitized to it. And God says, you're stepping further and further out into the ozone layer. You know, one step beyond. You remember that movie, that, uh, that, that, that weekly movie? The Twilight Zone. Little do they know the church is in the Twilight Zone. Can you hear Rod Serling saying that about the church? Well, that's what God is saying right here. I'm going to leave you out there because you know better. We're going to be responsible for what we know. And that's what, what we're talking about. When I, when I asked that question, can we see that in the church? I think we do. Yeah. I think we can see that. And, and you know what? And, and when the Lord, when the, these murders, these unrighteous and sexual morality, they don't just stay out in the world because they want to, uh, they're going to come into the church. But when they come into the church, they feel that they can stay that way. See, you come to a church to be changed. We don't go to a church to stay the same. And so that's the, that's the, uh, that's the thing when a, when, a, when a leader or what Karen, piggybacking on what Karen said, from the pulpit to the pews, you don't encourage that kind of behavior. Can't. We can't because this is can't. not good. God has turned them over to that, that mindset. It reminds me of something uh, our son had said about, you know, you have someone come in the church and he said the Christians are so loving and kind. They'll feed them and they'll pray for them and they'll soothe their head. And that person will walk out and come back in that same door and start shooting up the place. That's the debased mind. That's the murderer. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but what do we do about it? Because God said that there, there was going to be persecution. But the world, Satan walks right into the church. But those who do come in to be changed... Those are the ones that when we preach to every Sunday, when the, 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 you preach for several weeks, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's working out the salvation by getting into a relationship and getting into the Word of God so that we can get into a relationship and know which spirit is talking mm -hmm. to us. And I, Yeah, and I think that when we, um, <clears throat> the longer you're, if you're in this thing and you're really in it for the Lord, it's going to show you can't go anywhere. I, I can't go anywhere, you all. I, I can't. You know, if somebody offered me a million dollars tomorrow to preach another gospel or said, hey, I'm going to put you on this program. Or, hey, I got land in, in Kalamazoo for you and your whole church. Let's come here and let us give you the sermons. You know I won't take it. Can't. You know I've got to do what I've got to do, what the Lord told me to do. Oh, I had ideas before I became a pastor. I thought I knew the road to success, and I still have ideas on how to bring success, I think, but I realize somebody else has to do that. I can't do it. I've got a job that the Lord has took away every, he's taken away all the ideas I've had. Forget it. This is what I want you to do. Forget it. This is what I want you to do. That's it. That's it. That's what we have to get to, you all. It is not going to be what you want to do. We can practice all we want to. We can look. Better not to look at the world. Better just use blinders. You know, one day I'll do a sermon. I'll have some. If I can find some horse blinders, I'll put them on, strap them on my head, and I'll do a sermon with horse blinders. But it'll have to be when we get back in the church so you can get the true effect. But that's that's what we want. I can't see nothing but Jesus. I can't see nothing but the Word because that's where we have to be to stay on on point with God, yeah. uh -huh. so that we don't look back from the plow. Once you look back. I was on the treadmill the other day and I tried to take my shirt off while I was running because I was sweating. And, and I went, whoa, as soon as I looked back, that thing said, boy, I'm going to throw you off of here. And we can't afford, and it taught me, you, and I know that, but we can't afford to look back from Jesus either. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to take our eyes off of him because the world will pull you away. Mm -hmm. And a pastor or a teacher or a leader 
who is looking at something else, he's in a very dangerous position. Mm -hmm. I know people right now, I said, listen, I, I'm, I'm not complaining because I don't have 20,000 people that I have to deal with. Glad I don't. Okay? Because when you're really preaching the word of God, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can teach 20,000 people and keep them all there. Somebody's going to be, somebody's going to float somewhere. But this word, this word is so important that we've got to be on top of it. And I think that uh, this, this, this book of Joel, just like the other books, speak very, very clearly on what we need to do. You know, it was, it was something that the Lord um, shared with me the other night, maybe two nights in a row. But it was, it's such a distraction in the world today. It's so much killing and it's so much going on in the world today that I'm asleep in the car and I'm speaking uh, with the, uh, I'm talking about something that was on the news. It's so deep in my spirit that I, you know, it caused us to fret, it caused us to be grieved. And the Lord said, uh, you're fretting and don't be anxious and don't worry. You, you have to be obedient to the word of God. The people in the world, they're doing what they're supposed to do. That's what they're supposed to do. He said, it's in my word in 2 Timothy. This is what they're supposed to be doing at this time. Now, what you're supposed to be doing, he's talking about me, what you're supposed to be doing is praying for them and praying that the Lord will draw them and praying that the Lord will lead them, that when the God does start, Jesus does knock on their door, that their ears will be open and hearts ready to receive. Our job is to pray. Our job is not to worry. Our job is not to fret. Our job not is not to sit in front of the TV and say, why did, she, why did this person do something so stupid? I'm like, wait a minute. That's the world. They're going to do stupid things. Oh, you're talking about the shooting of that young man. Yeah. yeah okay. That, well, I didn't want to make a reference, but my well, point... it happened, so... Yeah, my point is that... that we get too involved in the world when we're supposed to, when we get on the prayer line, that's what we're supposed to be praying about. But, but not to fret about it, not to take it to bed with you. And so we have to really be careful because now that's a distraction. Well, just like, just like everything else, uh, the, the Bible tells us more to come, right? There's more to come. We just, Isn't that doing what they're supposed to yeah, be doing? We're just going through it and the Lord takes care of it. So let's stop here. Um, and what we'll do is uh, next week, I want to go over, of course, Chad, this is a short book, but I certainly want to want to look at uh, chapter two. So be prepared and we'll hope we might even finish up next week and then move on to Amos. But uh, anyway, uh, this chapter, uh, chapter one is good and the whole, of course, the whole Bible is good. But we can tell from this message that it is a warning primarily to, to turn God's people back to God before an even greater judgment occurs. Amen. So with that, we will close out and uh, um, God willing, we'll come back next week. So to those of you who, who uh, are, are here with us, we appreciate your time and we appreciate you sitting in. All of you who couldn't be on Zoom. We that, have them uh, on, on, on Paris. We have them on Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, Andrew and Caroline. And, Andrew and, and Caroline. Uh, God bless you, Sister Caroline. Elwanda. You and your son, Elwanda. And uh, Fern Eastman. Fern East. Hello, Fern. Yes. How are you? Oh, and, God bless uh, you. Let's see. She's on Facebook. And then we had Amen. Yolanda. Yolanda. Uh, and everybody we else. We, we thank you all. We, Brother Andrew. Uh, Brother Andrew. You know my, me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not keen on, on these uh, uh, Deb Deville, social Debbie. medias. Mm -hmm. Deb Deville, God bless you, Deborah and everyone yeah. else um, and who tuned in, Sister Phyllis, and Julius Gray, and Julius. All right, mm -hmm. praise God, my man. All right, so uh, we're gonna pray out, and God willing, we'll see you all back next week, hopefully. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for everyone here, Lord, and uh, we just ask you, Lord, to be with us and continue to guide us and keep us. Look, Father, and uh, bless those who uh, tuned in tonight, Lord, and uh, continue to keep us healthy, Lord, until you have us back here again. These things we pray in Jesus' name. And I was all, I almost missed it. But if those of you who have not accepted Christ, it's time, it's time, it's time. Mm -hmm. Don't wait. Don't wait. All you need to do is believe in your heart and repent your sins to Jesus Christ. Confess it. 
okay? Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, and believe in your heart that he died for us and God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. That's what it takes. You cannot get to heaven without that, okay? Otherwise, when you, if, if he takes you home tonight, you wouldn't be able to go to heaven. So can I pray this prayer for you and you, uh, if you believe, and I pray that you believe, you know I'm not going to stand up here and sweat like this and, and just make up stuff. This is the truth. This is the word of God. So pray this prayer with me right now. Those of you who are watching, and if you're in a, in a home with someone and they don't know the Lord, bring them in the room right now. Yes. And we're going to pray for them right now. If they pray with us, they can, they can join us and be children of God. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I repent my sins to you right now. I believe that you are God and you died and God raised you from the dead. If that's you, will you come into my life now and be my Savior? I accept you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus name. If you prayed that prayer and you believed it in your heart, you are a child of God. Congratulations. Grab yourself a Bible. Get a Bible. And let the Holy Spirit start working in you. He's going to bring you around to where you need to be. It's a lifelong process, but it's the best place to be in. Because when this life is over, you're going to want to be with the Lord. Amen. So God bless you all. Hope to see you next week. God willing.